Now, I've got the Palette RTX 4090 graphics brick on hand, and these are the results of the RTX 3090 and 3090 Ti on LN2 versus this card running on air cooling stock as well as overclocked. Yes, this thing absolutely destroys the previous gen 3090 cards on LN2. Let's get on with the review. So first of all, as you can see, this is a really massive triple fan, uh, almost four slot thick graphics brick that you can slot into your gaming PC and run basically all the games you want on it. Um, yeah, so let's take a closer look at the card design itself. So the palette card is a triple fan design, as you can see, just like all the other RTX 4090s. But this is not even one of the larger cards, it's actually not that tall, although it is still pretty thick and it does cover the whole front of the card with a huge heatsink that extends way past the PCB as you can see here. So the end of the card is just a heatsink that the fan can just blow right past because the PCB stops right before the end, which is I guess pretty common these days with the newer RTX cards from Nvidia and I guess maybe some of the Nvidia AMD cards as well. Now on the back side of the card, the PCIe slot is just over three and a half slots and you can see that the card extends way past it in terms of thickness as well as the height so this is quite a huge card you got to make sure it fits in your case but again this is actually one of the smaller rtx 4090s although this is still larger than the founders edition card the heatsink itself is quite intricate using lots of heat pipes i think there's eight of them and a vapor chamber to spread the heat from the gpu and memory all the way to the heat sinks and just dissipate it to the air using the three large fans that Palette put on the front of the card which actually if I look closely looks really high quality. These fans are actually thicker than the typical GPU fans and they also have some wing tips as well as actual plastic rings around the blades to help increase static pressure. So in theory these fans should work really well and they just really feel high quality to me in terms of the thickness of the plastic they use and everything. And lastly, the card has a new power connector that's standard with all the RTX 4090s. So for the test system, I'll be using my Intel Core i9-11900K, which has been overclocked to 5.5GHz in single core, going all the way down to 5.2GHz in all core overclocks. This is quite a powerful CPU still, and it should still be about as good or better than a 5800X or 5900X CPU. And it also has 4x8GB of 32GB of Samsung BDI memory overclocked to 3600MHz at CL14. Now, it is really quite something to plug in a graphics card this big into your system, especially when your system is an open-air case and when you install this graphics card, it really does look like most of the system is just the graphics card. It's just really huge, but it doesn't seem to be an issue, at least in my open bench case. I can just screw it in and it doesn't really sag or anything like that. I don't really even feel the need to use the GPU support bracket that Palette has included in this card. Now for plugging in the power as well, I kind of don't like the new power connector design as well. As I've said in the unboxing, it just feels kind of flimsy. But that's pretty much how it looks like. It also looks really messy with the adapters. So uh, yeah, I guess we'll just have to live with it until we get power supplies that already natively support this new ATX connector, the PCA 5.0 graphics card power connector otherwise you'll have this spaghetti mess turning on the graphics card as you can see it does have some nice rgb effects that palette has integrated into the crystalline uh, shroud that they've installed on the card which they're calling the midnight kaleidoscope i guess it does look kind of like somewhat inside something inside of kaleidoscope but yeah if you like the rgb you like it otherwise you won't like it that's just how it looks inside your case or you can also just turn it off and have a nice black finish so I've immediately overclocked this RTX 4090. What I've managed is plus 135 MHz on the core and plus 1700 MHz on the memory, maxing out the voltage and power limits as well. And this is with the power limit only at 111%, which this graphics card only allows because it's only up to 500 watts, versus the 600 watts of the FE and also the Gigabyte and ASUS cards. So this is kind of lower than the other higher end RTX 4090s and I'm kind of disappointed in that. But as you can see, the clock speed attains is still quite good. It still hits over 3000 megahertz on the core and also the memory almost reaches 1.2 terabytes per second of bandwidth. So that is quite fast. And yeah, this overclock is easily sustained by the cooler as well since the power is barely increased and I'm increasing the fan speed. So the temperature stays quite low. 
So this RTX 4090 is not really a big deal that it's using a lot of power. Now I don't really have other cards to compare this with, but I'll show you guys the game benchmarks anyways. Now the games have been tested at 4K at the absolute maximum graphics settings that they provide. And as you can see, it runs them really easily. All the older and easier to run games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Horizon Zero Dawn or Forza Horizon 5, they're just running way over 100 FPS. And at this point at 4K at max settings, I'm somehow almost CPU limited. So this is a really insane amount of performance. You can literally run anything without issue on your 4K monitor. And at those FPS, you probably need the high FPS 4K monitor as well. Now for the harder to run games like F1 2022, it's still just under 100 FPS and that's with max RTX settings as well. And this just shows the really impressive RTX performance of the RTX 4090 in the new Ada Lovelace architecture. And even in Cyberpunk, which is the hardest game to run I have right now, this game still lets it run at over 40 FPS. So the 4090 is still powerful enough to run Cyberpunk at max settings with Psycho RTX, which you wouldn't normally use on the RTX 3090. And without even DLSS, it's still running at playable frame rates. It's really quite insane the amount of performance that the 4090 provides. Now with DLSS on in Cyberpunk, as you can see, it does improve the performance quite a bit. And one interesting thing is that while DLSS still improves performance without RTX on, the biggest performance improvements are from RTX on with DLSS turned on as well. This is probably because without RTX, the game's FPS is just getting too high and it's almost CPU bottleneck by my 11900K because Cyberpunk does tax your CPU quite a lot. So the best option for this game is to just turn on all the RTX settings and just run it at DLSS quality, which seems to still have really nice frame rates even at 4K, which is really insane and just really makes me want to retry playing the game again. And also one thing to note is that the performance halving with RTX being turned on compared to turned off on the 4090 is just under half of the performance of the cards without RTX. So this is actually quite a good improvement compared to the like first gen RTX cards like the 20 series where you'll have a quite a larger amount of performance drop with turning on RTX. So Nvidia really did improve the RTX cores on this generation and it really shows in games that make use of the RTX hardware. Now for the power consumption, this graphics card actually stays under 400 watts most of the time in most games that I've tested. And it really only goes over 400 watts in games that are ultra heavy like Cyberpunk over here. And even then it's just barely and the clock speeds stay at over 2800 MHz and the temperature stays in the low 60 degree range with the fan speeds barely spinning at just over 1000 RPM. So this card runs really quiet and cool and keeps the clock speeds really high. And I think that's a really good result for this RTX 4090. And now during overclocked settings, as you can see, I hit just over 3000 MHz on the core and only now it's actually consuming over 400 watts. Especially with the voltage bumped up to 1.1 volts, it does actually sometimes hit the 500 watt limit. So I do wish it does have a higher power limit. But with the increased fan speeds, even the higher clock speeds doesn't increase the temperature that much and even the temperature actually drops with more fan speeds that you apply to the card. So the cooler is really quite capable and should handle higher power consumption, no problems. So the 450 watt stock TDP of the card is really not that big of a deal when considered that temperatures aren't even that high on this card. Although it is still weird that Nvidia set the power limit so high to 450 watt on the RTX 4090. Because in my testing, it really doesn't need more than 350 watts for getting decent performance out of the 4090. In my opinion, this is probably just Nvidia trying to compete with the partner cards by setting the Founders Edition power limit just up so high at 450 watts as the base power limit. Because otherwise, if they set the card to an efficient level like 350 watts, as you can see in the graph, which still keeps a decent amount of performance, Nvidia's card would lose to the partner cards, which is always higher power limits, as you can see in the previous generation cards in the 3090 and 3080 cards. But yeah, this time around, Nvidia is just coming right out with the maximum 450 watt power limit, which is basically like what the partner cards usually do. And in this case, they're trading efficiency with just slightly more performance. So if you want your 4090 to be more efficient, you could actually just lower the power limit to 350 watts, which barely reduce any performance at all. And even though you can see the points are just dropping below 20,000 points in 3D Mark, in actual real world gameplay, you're only dropping a few FPS, which 
you realistically wouldn't be able to feel at all. So yeah, I really think the 4090 should have just been a 350 watt card with partner cards that let it go above 450 watts. But Nvidia is just really seem to be really insistent on just competing with the partner cards by themselves. So I guess that's why they're setting it to 450 watts right out the gate because it's really not that necessary. So now let's take apart the graphics card and see what's underneath. Now, as you can see, there's lots of screws at the back and all you have to do is just take them all out, which will release the backplate from the frame that's in the front of the card. And as soon as we take out the backplate, I do notice that there is no thermal pads at all that's connecting the backplate to any parts of the card. But this is not a big deal because there is no memory at the back and the memory temperature stayed quite cool during my testing and it's not like the RTX 30 series with memory temperatures that are hitting over 100 degrees. Once you've taken off the backplate, you can just take off the screws that holds the heatsink and the card together as well as taking off the screws on the rear PCIe slot to take off the bracket and now you can free the PCB from the card. Although you have to be careful of the cables that's connecting the fan and the RGB header. So just be careful not to snap those off and just unplug them safely. And there you go, you get the card off of the heatsink and you can see that the PCB itself is actually quite short compared to the actual size of the whole graphics card. And now we can take a look at the VRMs that this card is packing which I am actually a bit disappointed with because it has a 3-phase memory VRM and only a 16-phase V-Core VRM, which is a bit less than the other cards that I've seen that has at least 20 phases and also the Founders Edition that has 20 phases and 70 amp power stages instead of the 50 amp power stages that Palette is using over here. These are using on semi power stages that are rated at an average of 50 amp output, which means a total output current of about 800 amps out of this VRM which is still plenty enough for the RTX 4090 because as I've shown before, it doesn't really consume that much power. But again, this is a premium card and I was really expecting a better VRM out of this RTX 4090. For the heatsink design, as you can see, they're using a vapor chamber base plate this time to spread the heat not only from the GPU core, but also from the memory chips, which is a great design because the previous gen cards ran memory chips that are super hot. So it's, it's really good that they're addressing this issue with this cooler design. Then the heat is then spread throughout the heatsink using 8 heat pipes which are placed on top of the vapor chamber. And it does work really well, keeping temperature super low, while the fans are really high quality as well and runs really quiet. So at least the heatsink design is really well designed on this Palette RTX 4090. So in conclusion, this Palette Game Route RTX 4090 has a really good cooler. I mean, you can see that it kept the temperatures really low at stock speeds in the mid 60s and even drop the temperatures once overclocked as long as you increase the fan speed somewhat and it runs super quiet too so this is a really good option i guess if you want a really silent computer plus this is also one of the smaller rtx 4090s considering the size itself uh, compared to the 4090s that are super thick four plus slot behemoths and actually way wider than the pcie slots this is actually much more reasonable so it's a good option for that but the palette card is actually quite lacking in terms of the PCB quality, in terms of the VRM that they actually put to power the GPU core. They're only using 16 phases of 50 amp power stages, so it's really quite behind even the Founders Edition at 1400 amps and some of the other aftermarket cards that have come out with 20 phases of 50 amps at least, which will be a lot more powerful than this. Sure, the 4090 is actually a lot more efficient as I've shown, so it doesn't really need that much VRM capability. And this is probably fine, even fully overclocked and power unlocked. But it's just, it doesn't feel great buying a super expensive premium card while the VRM is lacking. Although the build quality is really nice and I guess it does feel premium, you know, with all the brushed aluminium that's on this card. And I guess if you like the RGB, then the bling bling factor of the crystal shroud is actually also pretty cool. But otherwise, yeah, this card uh, performs really well. It's just that the VRMs are kind of lacking. And I wish this has a higher power limit BIOS like some of the other cards. Although, um, yeah, not super necessary. But still, the overclocker in me is kind of disappointed in terms of the power limits and the VRMs. But yeah, that's about it for this review of the Palette RTX 4090 Game Rock OC. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe you found something useful out of this. And if you like this video, please click the like button and maybe click subscribe to see the eventual RTX 4090 buyer's guide or which graphics card to buy video, which will be coming pretty soon as long as I've got all the info on the other cards as well. 
And yeah, comment down below what you think of this card and if you think the RTX 4090 is a graphics card that you want to buy. But that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.